Uh, but now it's kind of time to reset and refocus. And I'm happy and thankful for you guys to be able to join me today here at AI Live. Um, it's a little bit different. Typically, it's going to be Gideon and Lori. Um, but tonight, they have both previous obligations that, unfortunately, they're not able to join us tonight. And so, but I think, you know, we decided to bring a topic that actually, even for me, uh, I probably should introduce myself for those who don't know who I am. Uh, my name is Enoch Kwok. I'm the CEO for Skin Perfect Medical, but also for here at the Aesthetic Immersion. Uh, next year will be our 20th anniversary of our Skin Perfect Medical offices um, here within Southern California. And so um, tonight we're going to be talking about business and really more thinking about potentially what you need to do to plan for a successful 2024, right? And so that's kind of going to be the main topic for tonight. And feel free, chime in if you have any questions. Um, please enter them into the chat down below. And I'll be able to kind of get through and hopefully answer some of your questions throughout the evening. And um, tonight we're going to be running through what I believe a little bit more higher level, thinking about how to master some of your business strategies to really help you elevate your practice in the new year. Right? There's no better time to start than now, especially being, again, the first business day of the new year, and to really consider how do I really focus and how do I really, uh, really be impactful this year and making some good, some strong changes so that I can be, I can build and you can build a more successful practice in 2024. And again, tonight we're going to be talking about business, right? It's the timing, it's the new year, uh, we need to set new goals. And we need to think about what's happening in 2024. And if we don't have a plan in place, if you, if you aren't planning to succeed, you're basically planning to, to, to fail, right? Um, it's just one of those things where you have to really think about from a business side, what are you going to be doing this year different than what you did in 2023? 2023 was, you know, for all intents and purposes, one of the more challenging years in our industry. When you look at all the top line metrics, considering across the board, um, when I looked at a lot of vendors, there was slower growth this year than ever before. We experienced that within our own practices here um, in Skin Perfect. We had some practices grow double digits. We had some practices kind of not grow as much this year, uh, even though we are setting different goal growth goals across the board, similar ones across all of our offices. We just had different locations perform differently for various reasons, right? Um, hopefully for you and your practice, you know, you also experienced growth in 2023, and hopefully we're here to continue to see growth into 2024. But if you didn't, you know, it's also then a time to maybe reflect and really think about some of the things that you're doing right now in your practice and maybe areas that you need to change and maybe to, do, to, to hopefully get some information today from this high level approach on how I look at our business, how I look at aesthetic medicine, how to look to our medical spas, and how do I implement certain business strategies into our practice? And hopefully it can share some insights um, and not just top line strategy. Again, it's gonna be a lot of high level stuff today, stuff that maybe you've never seen before, but hopefully we can also talk about tactical and maybe taking action on some of these items tonight. Okay, again, feel free to comment in the chat if you have questions or clarification. If I run things too quickly, we only have a, maybe like 40 minutes tonight with us. Um, of, of this presentation, a little bit, a little bit less. Uh, if there's plenty of questions, I can definitely try and get to them throughout the evening, okay? So onto the slide deck here. Just to give you a little bit, again, background on myself, CEO for Skinberg Medical Aesthetics. Next year will be our 20th anniversary. I've been um, with Skin Perfect now for about 18 years. And so we have you know, annual revenues exceeding $10 million. We have multiple locations. We have uh, 1.80 plus employees. Uh, we are top 1% of medical Zed clinics across various different vendors, two of the largest ones, Galderma and Allergan. So, you know, I've seen it all. We've, we've learned a lot. We've grown a lot. And so hopefully tonight I can share a little bit about what I've done and, and talk a little bit about more about how potentially I can share some information with you on how to help you grow your practice. Okay. So business growth strategies, business strategies for growth in 2024. I am a big believer in really now understanding that, you know, it does take a mentality. It does take a mental shift sometimes to really break the mold and to really move your business from, from level A to level B. Um, a lot of times, that's why I like to in include mindset shifts of, of maybe changing your thought. Maybe it's something that you never really 
uh, had learned about. Again, a lot of you are potentially healthcare providers. Some of you, or a lot of you probably are even solopreneurs, right? You're just working alone, doing your thing, doing the best you can with the training that you have had, which probably has been a lot in healthcare, in medicine, in taking care of patients, in customer service, in bedside manner. Um, maybe business, you've never taken a business training course, right? And so the, re the, the reality of this particular industry that we're in, we are in retail medicine. So we are guided and, and, and bound legally and medically by our medical boards in our states. However, we also have to compete in the retail sense against other retail businesses. Similarly, in, as if we were a Target, competing against like a Walmart, competing against Kohl's, However we do, we have to compete and think in the retail market environment as well. And we have to combine all together because as we all know, the last few years, there's been a tremendous growth in the industry, right? You could probably name two or three or four or five new med spa slash dermatology practices that cosmetic plastic surgery practices that have opened up within your area. The competition is fierce and it has grown even more intense as of late. And so, you know, the biggest thing that you need to consider is what, as a business owner, as a provider that's on the grow, on the move, what are you doing to take action, right? And, and action is the antidote to adversity. If you had a challenging year in 2023, do you let that bog you down? I mean, there are moments that we, are, we do. I, we had our challenging moments as with any other practice. Again, even though we've been around for a number of decades now, it doesn't mean we don't have our, our challenges and our own internal strife and external problems. But one thing I've learned over the years is you cannot let that bring you down. You have to move from that. And moving means that you're taking steps, right? You're taking decisive steps to pave the way for success. And so make sure that that's like the number one, sh number one man mindset shift tonight is whatever you learn today. You know, you may only p gain one piece of information that's actionable for you in your practice that's applicable to you or even within your scope of doing but make sure you write that down and be intentful this year to take action upon that, that thought, that strategy, that tactic, okay? You know, and, and kind of when I think about things, I always look at data. I look at, I really like to analyze data, internal data, external data, to help me formulate plans and help me to act, take actions. And, you know, in 2024, this will be an interesting year. Um, I think it's gonna be a good year, but it will start off pretty challenging, okay? But why am I so confident about this industry? Um, this is a survey that was done by, for those of you that are familiar with our industry, there is a, a magazine called New Beauty Magazine, okay? And the New Beauty Magazine, it's widely published. I've read it for, for many years. And they do an annual survey called the Beauty Engine. And you can actually Google search that, 2023 Beauty Engine. There's a website that actually show you the entire study. Uh, and they, say they basically took a survey of their readership. And so about 900 so plus people of their readers answered their survey. And one thing that you know about this particular magazine is an industry focused one. So it's our demographic, right? It's our clientele, those that are seeking to learn and get treated um, and actually want to get, well, again, want to get treatments, want to get aesthetic treatments. And so they are a prime demographic. And so this is something that, this was done in April of, of 2023, last year, right? And so, Thinking about the next 12 months, do you plan to spend more, the same, or less than you did the following 12 months for each of the fall? As you can kind of see, aesthetic treatments and procedures, 34% of the readers that, were, that answered the poll, the survey, said they are planning to spend more on services that we offer. They're planning to spend more on, on, on spa, and salon, spa and salon services, treat, and skincare products as dentistry as well too. But where are they spending to spend less on? Well, less on the spa, less on skincare, less on dentistry. You can kind of see more, less, the same. And what you can kind of gauge between this, between the more column and the, the same column, the far left and the far right, when you add that up together, it's almost like 97%, 97% of people, if you want to kind of look at that, are still thinking aesthetic treatments are in their future. Why? And I believe the answer is simple. We deliver results. We deliver visible results. You know, spas and salon services, they're always gonna be there. But, you know, it's an idea of a spa is, is something where it's, 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 it's relaxing, it's maintenance, it's long-term, but the stuff we provide, the treatments we provide, 
potentially have very impactful short-term ramifications where you can see help somebody with their skin issues well, mo I mean immediately right right from the get-go and so thinking about that this is what gives the confidence hopefully for all of us if you are a business owner or even just a provider looking to see where's wh what does 2020 look like we we are, are hopeful that people are going to be spending more money on our treatments while that may for some of you that maybe they didn't happen this year um, due to a potential contraction in the market. This is just something, again, our, we just need to find our, our prime demographic, right? We need to find the customers. That's kind of what this service shows. And so what can I do to prepare my business for success? And so we're going to cover a couple of these different topics here uh, this evening. We're going to be talking about, you know, understanding the customer experience, a little bit about marketing, um, understand the idea that a business, especially in challenging times, uh, more so than not, requires more effort to build stronger relationships. And this really refers to uh, not just relation with your patients, but I would argue even from an outside marketing perspective to really look within your community and to start building strong relationships with, with partner businesses, right? And figuring out how you can talk to those business owners, talk to their clientele, see how you can get the word out about your practice. Um, this is a year also too, and if I had to say for those that are afraid of numbers or looking at numbers, don't really understand, you really have to start get wrapping your mind around the idea, I need to know what my KPIs are. I need to know my key performance indicators. I need to understand profitability. I need to understand pricing. I need to understand you know, how many patients I'm seeing a day, how many treatments are performing. All of those KPIs, right? Because that data for me somebody that's on the operation side that only does the business data is a big big it's it's such an important part of when i make the business decisions in terms of how i look to improve our operations i need to look at some data otherwise i'm only basing decisions off how i feel and that can change from day to day week to week from patient to patient from interaction to from every interaction with different employees right that's just not something that I want to be able to, uh, I don't want to be running a business that way. I have to be running off of hard data. And the last thing this year really is to continue to invest in ongoing learning and development. I think it's key to really f uh, focus on, like you are today, joining us tonight, again, on the first business day of the year, coming back from all this vacation, thinking, hey, I really need to think about what I'm, how do I set myself up for success in 2024? I need to learn more. If you're a provider, that I would say again comes to potentially learning new treatments, learning and not even learning new treatments where you have to go buy new technology or bring new products on. As I mentioned earlier, thinking multimodal, right? Thinking about how you can combine different treatments together with the stuff that you're already doing and bringing it as a new package and reselling that as a new service and new treatment to your patients. That would be my number one actually recommendation for you this year. Go over your inventory, see what you currently have, and see how you can combine different modalities. If you're not unaware, if you're unsure, then you need to go you know, learn on how other providers are mixing and matching and adding layers and different treatments in together to sell a higher, higher package treatment to your existing clientele. Right? Um, this is gonna be key. And like I said, I've been talking about that for the last six months with my team here at Skin Perfect about thinking about how you can combine treatments together. You have to be able to create the upsell opportunities as well as those cross-selling opportunities in introducing services to your existing patients, all right? I think also really from a business concept of, of business, how do I approach this really? Thinking about how to structurally set things up to say, hey, I have a goal, I want to be able to do something, this is just an acronym that's very common within the business world, kind of a smart kind of goal setting where you're setting realistic goals and timelines, right? But it's not just saying, hey, I want to be able to do this. I want to grow 10% this year. Great. So you've already been specific. You're kind of measuring, right? If you have the S and the M, you're measuring a growth by, well, I'm going to look at my revenue. You want to kind of set some achievable numbers. But then what's relevant? What's relevant to that goal? What do you need to do to, imp imp to get to that 10%? Is it... 10% growth in fillers? Is it 10% growth in your body sculpting? Is it 10% growth across across a specific treatment? Or 
are you looking to bring on new technology and will that new technology spur your growth by 10%, right? So if you're a million dollar practice and you have a new technology and you say, hey, this new technology I'm gonna bring in, it's gonna generate an extra $100,000 in revenue this year. Well, that is a smart goal. That is a smart thing to think about of thinking, hey, I can hit my goals, but I, this is my format. This is the way I'm gonna do it by bringing on a new technology, a new treatment, and I'm gonna focus on upselling this treatment to my existing patients um, to the tune of, again, if you're a million dollar business, another $100,000 a year, right? When you think about that, um, 12 months, you're looking at uh, like another $8,000, roughly $8,500 a month of that new service that you need to bring in order to grow your business, right? And time-based, you really want to be, be, be intentful of setting a goal for this month, 30 days, what do you want to get done? Uh, a quarter, you, th in the next three months, you want to get done? You know, originally, when I was running and really planning out, you know, I tried to do a year, six months, a year out. I know some people tell you a five-year plan. You know what, the five-year plan for me from a, a practical, practical perspective was never something that I used on a regular basis. However, the five-year plan helped me visualize, right, to potentially have a vision of where I want to be. That's where I think that helps you the most because things change from day to day, month to month, year to year, right? Um, but being having a time constraint on that gives you uh, pressure, right? It gives you a, a goal. It gives you a time like, hey, I need to be able to push together, push together to do things by this time in order to make sure that I'm hitting my goals and, and make sure I'm hitting goals. Because if you just set a goal but don't have a time and when to achieve it, it becomes potentially a six month goal. It could be pushed out, oh, it's not a big deal. I'll push out to a year. I'll push out to two years from now. Like again, day one of business this year, that sets some good goals to kind of set for the next 30 days and what you want to get done in the next 90 days. You know, when you kind of talk about marketing, you know, the, thinking about effective marketing strategies, right? I think it's something where for those practices, and I get, like I said, for us, we have seen a dip in new clients. That is something that we did, we did notice starting in 2022, actually, compared to 2021, we saw a percentage dip in new, con new, con our new consults across our board, across the board. And then we saw another dip from, 2020, from 2022 to 2023 this year as well. What's, what we kind of have to factor into, at least what I'm considering it to be, is there are definitely macroeconomic issues at, at play, right? People have been spending money uh, the last few years after COVID, and now potentially that spigot is starting to dry up a little bit. And so people are becoming more uh, aware of the money they have to spend or the budget that they have, right? And so in general, and this is what I've talked about in the past too, not only with my team, but with some people on, on our AI mentorship team, is you really have to start thinking about focusing on existing clients. Because you cannot only focus on saying, I'm going to get new clients, new clients, new clients, because if there are new, no, new, new clients and that has has dropped and again we're in southern california at least for our practice we've seen that drop you have to consider kind of the the psychology behind that a new client a new potential customer and patient if they're not currently spending money within our space in the aesthetic world they and their and their budgets are tight they're not going to be looking to spend new money that they that they're that they haven't budgeted for something right so they're going to be spending money on you know, their mortgage and their car payment and just groceries and, you know, inflation again, it, it, it's a big factor, right? There's a lot of things that have caught up to the American, American consumer. But you have to consider that if a new client is already tapped out, they're not going to be going to look f for new ways to spend new money. You're going to have to go back to your existing patients, patients that already understand the value of the services you offer, the value of the treatments you, you, you provide to them, and figure out how to get them to visit more frequently or get them to spend more money, right? So that's kind of the, the two-pronged approach. How do I get an existing patient to spend more money per visit, per transaction, higher average transaction value? Or how do I get a patient to come back more often if they were maybe only coming back once every six months, how do I get them to come back once every three months, right? What are some marketing things I can do to effectively get them to come back. So again, thinking about marketing strategies, 
you know, it's really effective marketing requires an understanding of the consumer behavior, market trends, and competitive dynamics. Again, two things I already covered in here is the market trends. Market trends are showing there's a decrease in new clients. So what do then we need to adapt? We don't have to, we can't keep chasing. Well, how do I keep only getting new clients? I'm not telling you, you stop trying to recruit them, but costs are going up. Acquisition costs have gone up on my marketing spend. You know, so it becomes, I'm throwing more money and I'm not getting that return. Well, what do I throw that money that I'm allocating, originally allocated for new clients and throw it behind incentivizing my existing patients to spend more money, right? Again, a different shift based off of the market trends. Consumer behavior, right? If people aren't spending money in aesthetics right now, it may be hard for them to pull out new money to go spend money, in, to, to spend money with you. It's just a fact. You have to then, again, leverage back to your existing patients. Their behavior is ready with you how to figure out how to market them on, again, a couple of the things I talked about earlier. And the competition is fierce. You have to be able to compete. You have to stay active in the marketplace, right? And marketing is a big thing. So which, how do you market? Again, going back to the survey that was done by a new beauty magazine called Beauty Engine, you can kind of see this is which social media platforms, right, are people on. And this, what's interesting about this particular data point was that it compares three different years. 21, 22, and 23. And you can see there has actually been a big shift, a big dynamic shift, not necessarily in a positional shift, it's still one, two, three, four, but when you look at the actual numbers of what stands out the most to me from the biggest thing is 21 is TikTok, right? 2021, 5.9% of their readers were actually on TikTok researching information. But now come two years later, 18.7% of them are on TikTok. You know, that's a threefold increase in number of people doing research on TikTok to find information about aesthetic treatments. And not even aesthetic treatments, here specifically even aesthetic providers. You know, Instagram still, it's still the king. I would still argue it's still the king, even from our data points. When you're talking about social media specifically, Instagram still has the widest appeal. It still draws in the most patients, um, but it's something where that has decreased mostly probably due to the, to the advent of TikTok, right? You know, Facebook has increased some as well, kind of reclaim, reclaim some of its, reclaim some of its, its old day, glory days. Uh, I think that's due to uh, the, the, what people go on Facebook for nowadays and use really specifically for a lot of advertising, right? So again, thinking about marketing, big overall strategy, right? Again, there's so many things that you think about and how do you tie it all together? Well, these are just, again, some recommendations on how to focus and think about how you market. And when you're thinking about marketing, you're thinking about the product, you're thinking about the pricing, the promotions, what your place is, the people that you're targeting, the planning, the partners, the presentation, and again, the passion for figuring out what can you do, right? There's so much to do in marketing. It's, it's, it's untenable, really. Digital marketing, print marketing, social media marketing, right? There's a website, there's, there's emails. Uh, and posting content, YouTube, there's just so much stuff out there. You know, I think creating an, a, a strategy that's focused around products, what services you offer, and how do you make them unique to the marketplace. I think that is really key, number one. Uh, number five is also key, figuring out who your target demo is. You know, are you targeting females that only want to do lips? And if you're doing lips, what age demographic are you looking for? But if you are a lip queen and you're able to inject and do lips great, thinking about that, is that great for your business in general if you take a step back? You know, in general, from what I, from my experience, a lot of lips are being done on younger patients now, right? Because of social media. And unfortunately, sometimes they're only one syringe people, one syringe patients. Is that gonna help you move your, your top line and your bottom line? if you have patients that only come in for one syringe, right? Again, we allude to earlier the point, you need to start getting patients to buy more, your existing patients to buy more, or new patients that potentially are a targeted demographic that have higher income, that have higher need for more of services you offer. I would argue somebody in their late 40s that has, has maybe more settled in their career, a more f firm family life, a more set budget, more disposable income than somebody in their, in their mid-20s that's looking to get lip filler, targeting somebody in their mid to late 40s will probably better, 
better benefit you as a business owner slash provider because those will they have more needs and you're they have more budget to spend right again thinking of the target who you're targeting in that in that in that marketplace right something to really consider there um, you know getting back to the marketing here I think something another question that comes up frequently is should I be paying for marketing online you know that's an interesting question we do we spend you know tens of thousands of dollars a month marketing online through paid advertising through Google through Instagram through even through TikTok as well you know if you're a startup if you're a smaller practice you might not have that budget you know and I would say if you don't if you don't have a reputable agency that you can work with and partner with it potentially can be throwing money down the drain because you could potentially spend three to five thousand dollars ten thousand dollars and not get a single patient from those marketing paid ad campaigns if you're not properly managing it if you're not properly setting the expectation of what to ask your agency partners you know a few months ago about six months ago i did a business workshop where i broke it down into a marketing there's a worksheet in there too um, i did some staffing it's still a, a webinar that you can purchase on our website and it covers all the things that you really want to kind of figure out how to talk with an agency about setting your goals setting your cost per lead your cost per click you know definitely go back and review some of that information if you did buy that business package um, but you know agencies are important if you can manage them if you don't have that bandwidth or the budget then you really at the end of the day there's no no way around it you have to do that lifting right you have to kind of do that lifting with your team if you have a team if you don't have a team then the sole responsibility of marketing your practice falls on you right it does that you know, whether it's on social media becomes I think the easiest thing to do but then how do you how do you develop your voice what's your unique selling proposition amongst the noise amongst all the competition also producing great content online you have to find your voice you know that's the things and again you can Google search unique selling proposition a USP figure out how to create content that's really focused on targeting a certain demographic uh, again do some extra research there because I won't be able to again cover all of it tonight I'm doing a lot of high level stuff here but really think about that as well in this time here you know patient experience and patient patient uh, customer service right I think this is still in a, in a 2024 strategy this has to be part of upping your game in terms of making sure that you are delivering the highest level of experience and delivering the highest level of engagement for your patients right um, this comes from having better conversations with them this comes from understanding who they are why they're coming to see you you know it's all of the above it's when you deal with a patient how do you get them from from figuring out how they're looking for you how they're finding you awareness to consideration hey I know who you are I seen you on, I've seen you on Instagram I've done a Google search I've done a Yelp search then how do you convert them to coming in and actually then booking an appointment you know mindset shift number three a customer's perception is your reality how they see you online more now more than ever is going to influence their decision to make a real life decision to reach out to your practice that there has never been a time more than ever before where the online your online profile let's say and the profile is is not just one word it's it's not even just one website it's it's everything it's Google it's Yelp it's it's the before the photos it's potentially if you do YouTube your videos it's your TikTok it's your Instagram it's all of the above that perception you're creating by the content that you're putting out there is what the consumer is looking for and seeing as okay this is the reality they they she looks reputable this person looks trustworthy I like the results I'm seeing then I'm going to now it, I'm worth I, I'm, I'm looking to find that provider that can understand what I need and I'm going to reach out to them right and so this again is more statistics coming from new beauty the consult on average how many different aesthetic providers do you schedule consultations before sort of procedure two or three providers right again this is why it's critical to understand the idea of the patient experience not just in office but before they come into your office potentially new patients right um, how do they perceive you because once they make a decision that it's not only just you too once they come into your office if they see everything online looks great I, I think I like them 
I think I'm going to reach out for consults. Now they come to see you. It's highly unlikely that they're, you're the only one they're going to see unless you built such a brand on uh, such a powerhouse in terms of that, that conversion factor of say, Hey, you've messaged properly. You're talking to your, your prospective patients. And they're saying, oh, yes, you are the only person I need to see. That's very rare nowadays because there's so many options. You need to be able to, once that patient comes, not even comes in your office, but from that initial phone call, right? From the initial, let's say even online booking, if that's what you offer, the text message, uh, the email, however you collect these leads, you need to be able to make sure that you are then delivering on their expectations on that experience. Because again, 61% are visiting two or three different providers before they decide who they're going to see. Um, other than that, what other things are helpful for make a, to help a patient make a deciding factor in terms of who to choose as an aesthetic provider? I think you can see here important factors before patients, before and after photos on the provider websites. Again, I think websites is one. Social media, of course, is another. Looking at results. Patients want to come to you to see results. That's as simple as that. If your results don't look the style in which they, they expect or they are hoping there, you can provide their transformation to, 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 to help them, I guess. If it doesn't jive and your style doesn't jive, they're not gonna select you. But if you don't have enough of that stuff online, then they're not gonna know what type of results that potentially they can get from you too, right? And so, you know, I think this was another one. The 53% of, of, of potential patients are looking for providers work that are similar, that look similar in age, ethnicity, and gender. So I know there's a diversification field happening. You know, we have different, you know, you want to be able to diversify especially different age groups, right? You wanna be able to service the 20 year olds, but also potentially service your late 40s. So if your Instagram page is only all 20 year olds patients, somebody that's in late 40s will probably get a picture of like, you know what? They're spe highly focused and highly specialized on the younger demographic and the younger look. That might not be my look. So I'm gonna look for somebody else that, re that, that I see that I can relate to with the results that I'm looking for, right? So I would encourage you to have that mix. You need to have that mix of different ages. Ethnicities, again, certain pockets. We have a practice that's really focused on an Asian Chinese demographic. So that layer is all gonna be Chinese and Asians, right? If you're in a, in a heavily African-American community, that's what you should potentially be, be putting on your social. If you're in a in Hispanic community, similarly like that too. It's just something where you're marketing to your target people that you, you want to show that, hey, I understand and I can relate with what uh, the results to the, res the, res uh, to the results I can provide to the results that you are looking for as well. You know, really being focused on the consumer and your customer this year in 2024, being very intentful about that, right? Understanding who they are, figuring out, you know, how to learn, look at the data points, look at what's, what's showing. Are you targeting patients that are higher spenders? Are you targeting patients that are are only onesies and twosies from a syringe perspective. You know, are you getting feedback? Are you getting good NPS scores? Are you getting good reviews? You know, figuring out how to engage them. If you have a team, if you're lucky and fortunate to have a team for front desk people, how you're able to then get them to help you extend and improve the level of customer service by incentivizing them, right? Ask for reviews, help them to provide that initial initial experience that is that is that is bar that, that that is not surpassed by anyone else within your local area right from the initial phone call from the initial text message initial email get the response get your team members to get to those people as quickly as possible because again it shows that you care about your customer and you're focused on them and respectful of their time that you want to get them seen early and quickly and in place here okay uh, which factors do you consider off-putting during site consultation? I think there are some things that are very interesting, but very expected here. Rude, unhelpful staff, bedside manner, time. You see, what was interesting though is in, in 2023, the cost of treatment. Yeah, they added a few more options now, but the cost of treatment really almost wasn't the number one thing. And some of you may think that's the case. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm the, everyone's looking for the cheapest product. Potentially, the, the target patients that you're targeting are looking for the cheapest product, the cheapest service, right? You know, I think 
then you have to just find your rhythm. I'm not saying you don't discount. I'm not saying you don't aggressively figure out how to create promotions to drive people in. That's, that's just the fact of competing in the retail business, right? But understand that if you have that hook, you get someone in, it's not the finally deciding factor to end up deciding why I'm gonna choose you. It's the rapport you're building, your team is building with that prospective patient, okay? You know, as we kind of get to the last 10 minutes here, again, if you have any specific questions that you want to answer, feel free to answer in the chat. Uh, we're gonna kind of talk about some of these other items, but now that we kind of are thinking again, unfortunately, we only have, you know, 45, 50 minutes to really talk about 2024 and business strategies, right? I think we talked about uh, at a high level about what, what to start thinking about, right? Being customer centric, uh, patient centric, thinking about marketing, thinking about how you can start looking at your data. You know, all of that stuff, all that information, all of the, the strategies that you want to do, you need to start putting it together into a plan, into kind of what we call best practices. Something where there's a standardized guideline of how to properly execute marketing, let's say. So again, if your idea of I want to market to a certain demographic, what do I need to do? Well, best practices, I need to think about the type of content I want to post. I need to think about the type of material that I want to, that I need to get over the next few months, right? I need to strategically think about the target demographic. Do I want more 40 year old women to, to be more, more intentful on targeting that, that, that target demographic that I believe has higher disposable income levels, right? You know, how do you put that plan together? It's, and it's lining those things up. So every time you're, you're doing that and thinking about it, then it's this best practice and you're just following your guidelines that you've set, right? Best practices are set guidelines. Um, ethics or ideas that represent the most efficient or prudent course of action. For me, it's about there's efficiency here. I don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time, right? Um, especially in 2024. Now there is a time to start thinking, maybe doing things a little bit differently and reinventing the wheel per se for you and your practice. It doesn't mean that you have to reinvent the wheel in its entirety. There's plenty of resources now. You know, obviously AI is, is, is almost like could be your, your, your online consultant on what to build a marketing plan. If you've never used AI, ChatGPT, you can, you know, if you don't want to even use ChatGPT, you can just use Bard. There's plenty of other AI, bard.google.com is like the easiest one. You don't have to register and log in. Um, you just say, hey, help me develop a marketing plan to target social media um, visitor, social media demographic for women 40 and up within say the, uh, the New Orleans metropolitan area. Right, something specific, and they can start maybe give you some ideas to get your creative juices flowing. But once you get all those ideas in place, once you have all these strategies, you need to start being tactical. But then being tactical is laying out these different guidelines as to how to step by step to figuring out what to do. Right, um, attributes of a best practice of building something there, effectiveness. You know, there's all these different things that you can do. I would say a best practice really gauges thinking about participation. I think it really, again, we are in a people, we are in a service business, we are in a people pleasing business. Our business, if you have employees, also need to be able to get the team buy-in in terms of helping you grow your business. So when you build a best practice on something, say it's marketing, you wanna get partic high participation from, again, if, it's, if you have a marketing agency, get your marketing agency involved, right? If you have your front desk team, get them involved, get them to know the pricing, get them to know the specials if you're offering specials, get them to understand the importance of every phone call, every lead that comes in from your marketing campaigns that you're spending money on. Um, get them to really maybe even spend time to have them review your Instagram page together and point out certain things because if say that's a prospective client that's, a, that's asking about certain questions and they want to get some more information, well, I know the Instagram page is probably nowadays for the most part, you're you're ready to go before after photo gallery. So what if your front desk knows? Hey, yeah, on, if you have you signed have you followed us on Instagram? No, not yet. Okay, well, if you want to, if you can do it right now with the phone, we can help you do that. Follow us. This is our Instagram handle, and down here, 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 you'll see a lot of the particular results that we can provide based off the questions you're asking me. Right? Again, leading them to a way to reinforce some of the results that visually that they're looking for. And again, we tie it back to the data points. 60% of people are convinced by before and after photos. They want to see them, right? And so again, tying in that participation with your team will only make your strategies more effective. And that's where tying in best practice 
it makes it more effective if you can tap into all these different layers here, okay? Again, developing key best practices, key points, research, there's all these different things that you can do. Again, I think you can just, you can look online. The key thing is, for me, understanding what do you wanna do? What are the goals you wanna create? What is, within marketing, what is one thing you wanna do in marketing this year different? What is one thing within the patient experience that you wanna do different? What data point do you wanna keep tracking different this year? And how do you tie into the best practices in giving and tying in all those things you want to get achieved and building, a, a, again, a guideline for you or for your team to help you get to the point of saying, hey, what's the best practice for me to analyze my KPIs? Well, let's say I want to analyze my daily revenue. I want to see what, exactly what I'm selling. Well, a best practice potentially is at the end of the day, you have your front desk team, look through your schedule. I mean, if you have eight patients that day to kind of document how much revenue you generate that day, potentially even write how many patients you saw that day, um, write what treatments and you service them that day, and you'll start to see maybe trends like, hey, today I sold a lot of filler. Today, yes, yesterday I sold a lot of cool sculpting uh, or body treatments or something of that nature. And you'll start to see different trends here. So you'll be able to monitor that data and potentially measure it and then maybe take action upon that, right? So that could be a best practice, just a daily closing. You have your numbers, you know, you have what type of treatments are being sold that day, and then you just file that away, hopefully uh, like a Google Sheet or an Excel Sheet or something where then you can start looking at the data and start thinking, hey, yeah, this day we sold a lot of this because we ran a promotion, or this day we sold a lot of this because I was very intentful on upselling all my patients on this particular new modality that I just, you know, either learned about online uh, through a training or in-person training or watch the webinar, something like that where I learned something new and I then immediately took action and I applied it back within our practice, right? And so, you know, again, tying back to the beginning, action is, is the key thing here of all the different topics we've talked about tonight. Again, I know I've gone through it fairly quickly. Each, of, each slide can probably be covered within one hour, right? In terms of really then breaking down from strategy to being tactical and then building a best practice behind it. But the, all that information that we've covered tonight potentially can just go to waste if you're not taking action, right? Like I said from the very beginning, even if you only learn one thing, you may, want to make sure you're writing that down and saying, hey, I think I want to be able to be action, take the action on this in the new year. Now, 2024 will be a challenging year. It's going to be a tough year, in my opinion. Um, but those that the consumer is there, but it's not like it was. And don't get me wrong, again, I'm, I'm confident in the overall marketplace for aesthetics. The growth numbers are still going to are solid for the next few years, even in 2024. But, and the big but is you have to find the right demographic. You have to find the right consumer. You have to write the front patients. And typically when I go for that, when I talk about that, what ends up happening is people tend to think, I need new patients. I always need new clients. You have to really target your existing clients more so than ever and be able to deliver to them that customized, personalized, unique experience that makes them not want to go anywhere else. But more importantly, that you've built so much trust and relationship and rapport with them that they will actually continue to buy more and listen to your recommendations, right? You're not, we're not talking about overselling and doing things where you know, you're selling treatments that they don't need. Again, you as a medical provider really need to understand how to not only address the physical nature of what you see, but also the emotional side too of your existing patients, right? And I think if you come combination of that, that's where you start to see some good results there. All right. Um, I do see a few questions here. So, you know, we're going to kind of go over that uh, a handful of questions here and we can kind of talk about how to potentially um, do some things and, and, and figure out how to find um, some, some, again, for the first patient here, first question, how do I get the clients? I've been growing through mostly word of mouth, but I get my ideal clients for the service I love to do, such as PDO threads. Um, Yasan, if I'm pronouncing that correct. You know, the interesting thing is PDO threads for us has been a high growth driver for us for the offices I do offer, right? Um, that is the one that out of a lot of our ad spending in terms of paid advertising, that is the one that we actually see, have seen consistent returns on treatments related, on advertising that we're doing to PDO threads. 
you know, word of mouth is, is still the very best way to get your, to grow your patient population, right? Um, some of our practices that have been around for 15 plus years, 30 to 40% of new patients come from referrals. And the beauty of referrals is that they technically don't cost more money, right? You're not paying for that lead, you're not paying an agency, you're not paying Google, you're not paying Facebook, Instagram. You're, all you're doing is spending more time with your existing patients trying to ask them for referrals. And I think that's where, if you're mostly word of mouth business and you're providing great results, you need to probably double down on that even more so and to just really strike up more conversations, potentially spend more time with your patients, um, really talk to them about how to be able to meet their needs, not just in now, not just in this appointment, but build a treatment plan for the next three months, six months. Again, remember I referred to getting more touch points, right? Bringing somebody in more often, more frequently. And even if it's just an excuse to bring them in for an evaluation, even if it's just an excuse to get them to say and chit chat, that I think is a good use of time because the more touch points you have, the better you can build a relationship with them, the more rapport you'll have. So when they are ready to buy again, they will go back to you and purchase. You know, how do you get new clients? It is more word of mouth. Like I said earlier too in the presentation is figuring out how we can potentially partner with existing practice, existing businesses within your area that target the same demographic, right? Nail salons, hair salons. This is the area where the business cap needs to turn on. The marketing cap needs to be worn. You're not just a healthcare provider anymore. You are a business owner, right? You need to be able to step into that, that box, step into that role and to be able to say, Hey, I need to go, go to the marketplace and go talk to page, people that have other patients nearby and to be able to that potential patients nearby demographics of similar, um, again, people, I would say you know, women majority is again, still super majority of our clientele. Where are they hanging out? Where are they spending their time? Where are they spending their money? and being things strategically at that, and then figure out how to partner with local businesses to do something like that, right? Uh, quite, Catherine, I've just opened a med spa. People come in, ask about pricing, and try to haggle. As much as I want to get patients into the practice, I do not want to have this interaction or be forced to change prices to suit everybody who walks in. Any suggestions, right? You know, I think this is a common thing, especially in this economic environment, but really, even, even if we weren't in a challenging time, that has always been the case, right? And I think this comes down to what your bottom line is in terms of what you're willing to set. And then again, ref de deflecting the question from price down to the quality of the treatments, the quality of you as a provider, you know, you, you know, being new, it's challenging unless you had a patient base showing your results, right? Showing the consistency of your patients over three months, six months, one year, long-term clientele, you need to be able to sell them more on price. You know, and I think that comes from building the relationship, building the rapport, trying to, you know, I know that it's, it's, sometimes it's easy to be like, well, we're not the cheapest on the, we're not the cheapest on the block. You get what you pay for da, 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 kind of those standard type of, of, uh, I guess responses. But I think there's a reality here that you do need to do your best to get somebody in the door. And if you're willing to, you know, use excuses such as, well, this could be the one-time pricing, right? A one-time discount, a new client discount that I'm willing to do for you. And if you sense that they potentially can be long-term patients, then hopefully their next visit, they are then upsell, you're upselling them more and cross-selling them more, right? I think that potentially becomes more of a longer term play. You have to just learn how to communicate and how to meet people at their needs. Pricing is a need. It, it is a need that you need to you need to figure out how to talk around that, I guess. But really, it's more about how do you get to more importantly, why are they here to see you? What are the results? Maybe they're going somewhere else that is cheaper than you, but they're not getting the results there. That's why they're come looking around. Right. So how do you make sure that your messaging, what's unique about you? That's not just about the same at every single med spa down down the line, down down the street and really messaging that to them of saying, hey, this is what I can deliver for you. Personalized care, you know, concierge care, 24 seven, whatever, however you deliver on a higher level of experience. And that I believe people will pay for. And what I mean by that, your clientele that will want to stay with you. Okay. Um, how do I adjust for unforeseen product prices, product raises again, Allergan, 
all companies raise prices annually. We've all been experiencing that. This becomes the challenge of there's only two things you can do. You either raise your prices or you decrease your supply cost, right? That's really the simple math there. You either you raise your prices on that particular treatment. One, again, you may think I'm not able to. Well, that's just something you probably can, you, you'll need to. People are a little bit more open to having price increases passed on to them now more than ever, I would say, in this post-inflation, in this inflationary environment, right? You either need to increase the pricing there or you need to decrease the cost of other things within your business, right? Looking at your budget, where can you save money? Do you save money on other supplies? That's not skimping on the quality of the treatment. Um, you know, another way to think about it without from a cost perspective is thinking about the upsell opportunity, right? Or the cross-sell opportunity. With that patient, if you don't want to raise your price on particular service, well, then you need to really probably become an expert and you all probably should be developing the skill set on how to upsell and cross-sell. You need to be developing that skill set because then if you're, if you're keeping your, your, your Botox pricing the same at whatever price per unit, but you're able to sell an additional service or additional product to that patient during that same appointment, now you've created an average higher transaction value. Now you've made more money from selling something else, right? To selling something else without having to increase the price of what they originally came in for. So that is another strategy potentially to do. Okay. I'm Catherine. I'm crazy about pricing, before and afters. You know, pricing will always be that game. You have to brand yourself. You have to create your unique selling proposition online. And I think you have to go deep on that. And what I mean by that on competitor social media, you do need to build a portfolio. I mean, there's no way around it. This is a visual business. We are in a visual, visual days. Uh, time and time again, I can't keep telling all, and for decades almost, and telling you know, certain offices, hey, you need to make sure that you have your, your before and after photo best, pro best practice tightened up. It needs to be discussed. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be consented. You need to talk to every single patient to ask if you can get that now more than ever. The, you know, this is just the reality of social media. If, you, if you're not doing it, somebody else is doing it, and somebody else is looking at somebody else's stuff. So you have to be competing there. There's no, there's no way around that one. Um, it seems that my, most questions are from IG from people who are working on the med spas. You know, I think that's, again, they're doing their market research looking at competitors, maybe being scared about things. This is just something that goes with the territory. You know, I think what you can't let it do is, again, a mindset shift. You can't let it dissuade you from your primary focus of what you're trying to do. You know, if you're wasting time on the DMs, you're wasting time on the DMs, right? If you're, if you're answering them, you're answering them. That's why, you know, we have a policy to not try and talk about pricing from a, a quick phone call or a quick DM. You have to kind of get through the, the, you have to get through a certain process in order to understand, is this person legitimate or not? Are they serious or not? In order to get to that goal of, hey, getting a pricing, scheduling consult. You need to be asking for the consult during those DMs. That's key. Sales doesn't necessarily happen on a DM. It happens in the consult. Once they come talk to you, once they see you, when they visit you, that's when you have your highest chance to sell if they haven't already been sold, right? So that, again, it'll be recommendation there. Um, and Charia, I would say from a Google AI perspective, that is called BARD, B-A-R-D. So you just type B-A-R-D dot Google dot com. Uh, it's different than ChatGPT, um, but I use BARD just because it's easier. Um, you don't have to log in and do all that stuff. Um, and again, it has its version of AI. So it's going to be a little bit different, different experience, but very similar. You have to be able to prompt it. You have to be able to talk to it and share with what the information that you're looking, what specific information you're looking for. And that potentially can spit out recommendations on taking business and, and what you need to do for your practice. All right, so it's already been an hour. Um, very quick, very fast. Again, hopefully high level things to get your juices flowing to get you thinking about what to do in the new year. Hopefully some tactical advice that you can then take back to your practice. The key takeaway in this year, it's gonna be a challenging year. Those that will succeed are the ones that will be able to take the most action and it doesn't mean that everything you do is going to be right. It doesn't mean everything you do is going to be successful. You have to take the ups and the downs. You have to take your wins with the losses. But with the wins, though, you need to measure it. Why is it working? What's happening? And then if it's winning and you can double down on it, then you double, you triple, you quadruple. You keep doing those, you do that. Then you figure out what works for you. And then you emulate that in other different things, right? But the key thing is making sure you're taking action today, 
after this call, after this webinar, making sure that you are thinking about doing some actionable items, actionable steps, even tomorrow, about what you can do with you and your team. All right. We look forward to you here with us at the Aesthetic Emergent for 2024. We have a lot of great trainings coming up in person, online. Again, our mentorship library, over 360, 380 plus videos now. Never stop learning. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight here. And I wish you all a happy new year again and all a good night. <laughs>